Bill of Rights Day, everyone, and welcome to the National Constitution Center. My name is Jenna. I'm the Senior Programs Manager at the National Constitution Center, and I'm so happy that you can be joining us for Bill of Rights Day. We've been celebrating civic holidays since we've opened, and we're so happy that we can continue to do that in this virtual space. Um, and how we're doing that today is by bringing you inside our museum, though our physical doors are closed, our virtual doors are wide open, and there's so many great ways to um, interact with us at the Constitution Center and um, we are so happy to be able to be there for um, for people to help them learn about the Constitution um, and one of those ways is these great virtual tours that we um, do offer. We're going to put the link to the virtual tours if you want to book one for your school, for your club, for your uh, community center, family reunion, we'll do them all um, so you can uh, go ahead and uh, click that link and check that out. But um, today we are going to be looking at our Constituting Liberty exhibit because it is Bill of Rights Day and that's where we have our Bill of Rights. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Kevin, um, one of our educators at the Constitution Center. And Kevin, we're gonna be taking questions from the audience a little bit later. So we'll ask you guys to put the questions in the chat, but I'm gonna start with two basic questions, which is what is the Bill of Rights and why is today Bill of Rights Day? Thank you, Jenna, and happy Bill of Rights Day to you. Um, the Bill of Rights is our first 10 amendments to the United States Constitution. Um, so one of the more uh, significant aspects about our Constitution is that, you know, it's not necessarily done. It is a living document, uh, and we can continue to make new changes, add new amendments to the Constitution uh, if the vast majority of Americans want to do so. Uh, and we will go through and talk a little bit about the amendment process and how that takes place. Um, but December 15th is Bill of Rights Day. 229 years ago today, uh, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution were added uh, and thus completing our great triumvirate of founding documents that we're going to be highlighting in this space here. This is our Constituting Liberty exhibit, uh, where we highlight these three significant documents in early American history. Of course, I'm referring to the Declaration of Independence, the United States Constitution, uh, and the Bill of Rights. Uh, if you've seen the movie National Treasure, you will know that the original of all these documents are housed in the National Archives building in Washington, DC. But what we do have here are significant versions of each of these documents. So we're gonna walk through a little bit of stories about each of these three documents, uh, and then we'll look specifically at the versions that we have here. Uh, an engraving of the Declaration, the first public printing of the United States Constitution, and a version of the Bill of Rights, so which of course we're celebrating today. So let me begin with our first of three documents right over here. We have our version of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, now, it's interesting to note that on this day where we're celebrating the anniversary of a document, the date that we most associate with the Declaration of Independence uh, is July 4th, 1776. But it's disputed exactly what exactly took place on that day. And by some accounts, there really wasn't much that happened in Congress on July 4th, 1776. At least one of our famous founding fathers felt that Independence Day ought to be celebrated two days earlier, uh, and that was John Adams of Massachusetts. Uh, and over the course of his time at the Second Continental Congress, uh, Adams exchanged all series of letters with Abigail Adams, his wife. Uh, one of those famous letters included Abigail's famous Remember the Ladies quote um, that's really being inspired uh, right now as it is the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment as well. Um, but on July 2nd, 1776, Adams writes triumphantly to Abigail saying, the second day of July, 1776, will be the most memorable epoch in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, guns, sports, games, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of the continent to the other, this time forward forevermore. So aside from being a few days off on the date, um, Mr. Adams was pretty prophetic in his assessment on how Americans would celebrate Independence Day. The reason why he thought it would have been on July 2nd was that was the day that Congress voted on and approved um, the resolution in Congress uh, resolving to declare independence from England, uh, that these colonies are, and of a right, ought to be free and independent states. So how was it that we get around to July 4th as being Independence Day? Well, it had to do with a document that John Adams was involved in drafting. 
Adams was part of a five-man committee to draft a Declaration of Independence. Uh, in breaking away from England and severing their political bonds, um, Congress felt it necessary to articulate and explain the reasons why they were having such a breakup. And Adams, along with Roger Sherman of Connecticut, Robert Livingston of New York, Philadelphia's favorite citizen, Benjamin Franklin, recently returned from Europe, uh, and of course, the young Virginian Thomas Jefferson uh, were part of this committee to draft a Declaration of Independence. And Jefferson is chosen as the primary author. Uh, and there's sort of some dispute as to how he was actually chosen. Um, Adams recalled in, years, uh, in a letter years later that he gave Jefferson three reasons why he should be the primary author of the Declaration. One, you are a Virginian, and a Virginian should be seen at the head of this business. Two, referring to himself, Adams said, I am unpopular, suspected, and obnoxious. You, Jefferson, are very much otherwise. And third, you can write 10 times better than I can. Jefferson apparently never recalled such a reasoning of Adams, um, but it's important to note uh, a couple of these reasons, uh, particularly the first one, uh, Adams saying, Jefferson, you're a Virginian. Uh, and it was important in these early years of the revolution when much of the fighting had taken place in New England, um, that New England might be cut off from the rest of the colonies and support from the colonies north to south um, was questionable. So in much the same way that a year earlier, John Adams had appointed a gentleman from Virginia, George Washington, to serve as commander in chief of the Continental Army. In the same manner, putting a Virginian at the head of the document declaring independence was a way of maneuvering the more powerful Southern colonies to the support of what had largely been a conflict in New England. So Adams is really sort of bringing the colonies together. Jefferson, as the primary author, went through several versions of the Declaration. Um, several of the most famous lines from the Declaration um, were edited by Benjamin Franklin, uh, the long career newspaper man. Um, some of the earlier passages, uh, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable through uh, Franklin's tinkering became self-evident. And likewise, these inalienable rights Jefferson originally included were life, liberty, and the right to own property, as Franklin, of course, changed to the pursuit of happiness. Uh, and perhaps more significantly, an earlier version of Jefferson's declaration actually included a passage about slavery, uh, an institution that he blamed the King of England for. Uh, an original passage for Jefferson stated, he has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere. This piratical warfare is the warfare of the King of Great Britain. So here we have Jefferson acknowledging uh, the injustice of slavery. But this was one of several versions of the Declaration um, that the Continental Congress was unable to agree upon. Ultimately, Jefferson's attack on slavery would be left out of the final version of the Declaration. And the final language would not be finally agreed upon by the members of Congress until July 4th, two days after the resolution. So when the document was sent to the printer, John Dunlop, who printed 200 versions of the original Declaration, July 4th was the day that appeared on the document. Now, going through the rest of the revolution, um, what is clear is where the document would have traveled. It's not immediately clear when it was actually signed. Uh, we know that it was read to the troops uh, and throughout the colonies beginning on July 8th. Um, and then we believe that it may have been signed um, primarily on August 2nd. Um, but what we do know is that throughout the rest of the revolution, the document would have traveled with Congress, um, which often had to move. Um, particularly when the British occupied Philadelphia in 1777. So you can imagine that the care of the Declaration of Independence during these years um, was difficult uh, and rough at best. Um, and this really culminates, um, you know, as it goes through the revolution, during our first few years before the Capitol was built in Washington, D.C., um, the Capitol was in New York City and then here in Philadelphia for 10 years. Um, and as the early seat of our new federal government, the Declaration would have traveled with the Congress and then ultimately with uh, the seat of the nation's capital. 
Um, but when it moves to Washington in 1800, uh, a few years later, of course, we're at war with the British again uh, during the War of 1812. Uh, and during the summer of 1814, the British forces invaded Washington, burned the White House, burned a portion of the Capitol, and the Declaration again had to be hastily evacuated. So by the time we get to 1820, you can imagine that the Declaration was in fairly rough shape. Uh, if any of you have seen the Declaration today, um, you may note that it is near illegible in some areas. It is rather difficult to read. Well, apparently that was already becoming the case in 1820. John Quincy Adams, John Adams' son and a future president in his own right, was Secretary of State in 1820, and he was concerned about the care of the document. So he commissioned an engraver named William Stone to produce copies of the Declaration. And I have one of these copies right here. Stone was given the original declaration to work with, and it's in his possession for three years. It's not immediately clear what the exact process that he used to make his copies, but it may have involved a chemical substance uh, where he was able to transfer some of the ink off of the original declaration and apply it to a copper template where he was then able to trace his engravings uh, and make the plate, the template, that he could then use uh, to print his versions. Um, that actual copper template survives today, and it is on display also at the National Archives. Stone is able to produce 200 versions of the Declaration of Independence. Well, 201. He kept one for himself. Some of these documents were distributed to uh, presidents, uh, James Madison and James Monroe, the Marquis de Lafayette received a copy, uh, and two copies each were sent to the surviving signers of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, then Charles Carroll, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson, the latter two of which would pass away on July 4th, 1826, 50 years after the Declaration. Uh, and it is this document here, one of the few that survives, um, that is the best example that we have today of what the Declaration would have looked like when it was new being signed in 1776. So, and Kevin, let's move forward. Have, oh, oh well, go ahead. Before we move forward, sorry, Kevin, we have a great question from Emily in the chat box. And so I wanted to pose that to you. Um, she asked, when they wrote the Declaration, did they think, you know, there was hope? Like, did they think the Founding Fathers, um, could appeal to England and get them to, you know, stop performing the tyranny and treat them as equals, I'm quoting from Emily, or at this point, um, did the founding fathers have no intention of rejoining England and were just trying to found the country? And I think that um, going back to those dates, July 2nd versus July 4th kind of answers that question for us, doesn't it? It does, absolutely. Uh, and if I'm overloading you with uh, John Adams quotes here. Uh, it's important to note that not all of Americans um, were in favor of breaking away from England. And there was intense debate amongst members of the Second Continental Congress uh, about whether or not they would remain with England or not. Uh, John Adams remarked that he felt that the American population could roughly be divided into thirds. You know, a third were for independence, a third were against independence, and then a third were neutral. Uh, and even after the revolution had started, so you go back to Lexington and Concord and then Bunker Hill, uh, those battles outside of Boston took place a full year before the Declaration of Independence was written. And even during that time, after the war had started, Congress was still weighing the possibility of a compromise uh, with England. Uh, they had sent over what was called the Olive Branch Petition to King George. Uh, trying to reconcile and trying to get almost some autonomy, um, you know, sort of their own recognized independence, but still within the British Empire. Um, so it's a long process, and some of the founders are more quick to come to this break than others. But by the time we get to July 4th, 1776, uh, the members of the Continental Congress vote unanimously to declare independence. And Adams felt that was important. Uh, the saying was, all 13 clocks need to strike at once. Um, for them to declare independence, uh, it was important that all of the Americans, at least in Congress, had agreed to this break. Uh, and it was a, a months of intense debate before they came to that unanimity. Yeah, so by the time we get to Declaration, July 1776, we're, we're ready to go. We've um, decided that we're going to be independents, but the, that was kind of the culmination of several years and several negotiations, different uh, documents that um, uh, preceded that. 
So it's not like it was an overnight decision. Um, there were those moments that just wasn't July 1776. We had already made the decision by then. All right. So what we do know is that the declaration, while it's a great declaration of rights and equality, has no weight of law, right, Kev? No, it doesn't. And Tell us about the next document. <laughs> right. So even with the declaration and even with our victory in the War of Independence, we haven't completed the revolution yet. Yes, we've thrown off the old system of government, but to complete the revolution, we need our own set of laws. Uh, and with that, that would require uh, leaders of the now United States to gather once again at Independence Hall, uh, this time into the summer of 1787, uh, this time for the purpose of drafting a constitution of the United States. Uh, so let's move forward and check out our constitution of the United States. When the delegates arrived in Philadelphia uh, on May 25th, 1787, it's not immediately clear what their role was. You know, were they there simply to tweak the existing government, make some small changes? Um, the existing government was known as the Articles of Confederation. But it's clear by the spring of 1787, this version of government is not working. Under the Articles of Confederation, the states had their own currencies. So think of all the states that you all are from today. $20 of New Hampshire money might not be worth $20 of Pennsylvania money. Um, the states had their own relations with foreign countries. Uh, so for example, uh, shortly after the war, France, our ally during the revolution, was preparing to send 13 separate ambassadors to the new United States, you know, one to each country. Uh, and we sort of had that same thinking that you know, when people refer to their country, they're talking about their state. We're not yet thinking as a nation yet. Uh, and perhaps the biggest problem under the Articles of Confederation was that to get any kind of new law or amendment passed required unanimous consent amongst all of the 13 states, uh, which was incredibly difficult to do. So it's during the summer of 1787 that we need to come up with a new government um, for the United States to sustain. Uh, and that document, of course, would ultimately be the Constitution of the United States. What I have here is the first public printing of the Constitution from two days after the document was signed. And this is significant because one of the first things when on the first day of the Constitutional Convention, uh, there were two resolutions that were adopted. The first one was to elect George Washington unanimously as president of the convention. Washington's mere presence at the convention added legitimacy to it. If George Washington is going, then this is very important and we should attend as well. The other thing they do is adopt an oath of secrecy, sort of a closed door policy. So during the summer, even in Philadelphia, the largest city in America, the public was not aware of what was really going on. They knew there was a convention, but the windows were nailed shut and the delegates took an oath that they weren't going to disclose the agreements uh, and disagreements that they were having during the convention. And there were a couple of reasons for doing this. And you can imagine during that summer, all of the delegates had intense disagreement on what type of government we should have. You would imagine if they had an open forum where everyone was able to listen in and participate in the debates, there'd be so many different opinions about how to govern a country that we'd never get anything done. The other thing that it did was allow the delegates some freedom to be able to engage in some debate on some issues uh, that might not have been popular um, with representatives of their own states back home. During the convention, no one really got everything that they wanted. Some of the most intense debates during the Constitutional Convention uh, had to do with representation in Congress. Um, so this is really a battle between large states and small states. James Madison, known as the father of the Constitution, comes to Philadelphia after two years, really, of hard homework in which he researched all different types of past governments, uh, monarchies, democracies, republics, um, from ancient Greece and ancient Rome, what worked and what didn't work. And he comes up with a blueprint that includes a separation of powers and checks and balances among three different branches of government. Of course, our legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. But it was a property in the legislative branch uh, that caused a lot of debate among some of the smaller states. You'll recall today that, of course, we have two branches of government, the House of Representatives and the Senate. Well, under Madison's original proposal, 
both houses of Congress would be based on proportional representation. So larger states would have more representatives in each body. That of course appealed to the larger states like James Madison's Virginia, um, but some of the smaller states objected to this idea of proportional representation. New Hampshire refused to sponsor any delegates. The only reason a few of them showed up was they paid their own way. Rhode Island didn't send any delegates at all. And New Jersey comes up with its own blueprint uh, known as the New Jersey Plan by New Jersey's William Patterson, where it was sort of a loose changing of the Articles of Confederation based on equal representation. So regardless of the state's size and population, every state's vote would be counted equally. So of course, a great compromise is what we have today, where we have the two houses. Um, the House of Representatives is largely what the larger states would have wanted. So today, a state like California, Texas, or New York has a lot more representatives than smaller states. Whereas in the Senate, it's what the smaller states wanted, equal representation. And to this day, every state, regardless of its size or population, has two senators. Uh, so that was what the smaller states wanted. Sort of along with that, once we've agreed, at least in part, to do it on proportional representation, it now becomes a question as to who exactly is going to be counted. Uh, and you'll recall at this point that only white, wealthy, landowning men um, would have been able to participate in the political process and vote. Uh, and particularly, whether the question of enslaved persons, which made up about one in five Americans in 1787, would they be counted? Uh, and ultimately, it was the three-fifths compromise, where enslaved persons would be counted as three-fifths of a person for proportional representation. The third main debate concerns us today, and that is whether or not to include a list of enumerated rights in our Constitution. At this point, several of the states had their own versions of state bill of rights. Um, George Washington's next door neighbor, if you will, George Mason had been the author of the Virginia Bill of Rights. Uh, and he, according to Madison's notes, stated that he would rather chop off his right hand than put it to the Constitution as it was without a Bill of Rights. So if we take a look at our document over here, this is our first printing from September 19, 1787. So when the delegates agree on a version of the Constitution, uh, it would be signed on September 17th and sent out to the various states. This document here has the preamble, the first seven articles of the Constitution, and it identifies the names of all of the men who signed. But it is missing a Bill of Rights. Uh, so let's get to that in one second. A few points that I would like to make on our document here um, notably here with the preamble. Uh, you'll be familiar with the first three words of the United States Constitution. We the people. And this is sort of a break from the way that they used to start documents in America. Uh, other documents might have started, we the people of New Hampshire, New York, Massachusetts Bay, Connecticut, New Jersey, Maryland, and so on, listing all of the states. Uh, and there's sort of two reasons uh, why they might have adopted this language. Uh, a more cynical point of view might be that they weren't sure whether all of the states would ratify it yet. We still have a ratification process that is largely going to be uh, contingent on whether or not we're going to have a Bill of Rights. So we're going to see how that plays out in a minute. Um, so we're not immediately sure whether all the states are going to ratify. Uh, and that is reflected in the names of the signatures of the delegates right over here. I'm not sure if I'm able to zoom in that close, but we see here the list of all of the people, the states, that is, who ratified the Constitution. And we'll see here, it says the states of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Mr. Hamilton of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. So why Mr. Hamilton getting his specific designation? Well, the man could sing with the best of them, but he couldn't represent a quorum in New York all by himself. The states required a certain number of delegates to be there, and several of the delegates from New York had left the convention already because they were concerned about too strong a central government. So Hamilton, being the only one left, gets the special notification. 
So this sort of illustrates that we're not sure whether or not this constitution is going to be accepted. And people increasingly are calling for a bill of rights. Uh, there were three men who were present for the signing of the constitution who objected to signing and refused to, including George Mason, uh, because he wanted a bill of rights. So in our constitution here, we have our seven articles. It's not a particularly long document. Uh, the seven articles, the first three articles talk about our three different branches of government. Uh, the fourth article talked about sort of how the states would work um, and how sort of the federal government would relate to the states. The fifth amendment had to do with the amendment pro I'm sorry, the fifth article had to do with the amendment process. And we'll be seeing how that plays out very shortly. The sixth article stated that this constitution would be the supreme law of the land if, according to Article 7, at least nine of the 13 states would ratify it. So this convention doesn't mean anything unless the states agree to accept this new constitution. Yeah, so, thanks for getting into all the articles, Kevin. That kind of speaks to Bonnie's question that she just put in the uh, in the chat, which was what what principles in the constitution were new? We talked about it being like a revolutionary form of government, but we also know that the founders borrowed a lot of ideas. They had that big, like, you know, access to all of those books like by Locke and Montesquieu. Like, so what, what principles were new in that constitution? And then I know we want to move on to the Bill of Rights, so we won't <laughs> delay that too much longer. Of course. Well, a lot of the, the sort of central founding principles are radically new. Um, according to Madison's homework uh, and people like Montesquieu, um, democracies and separation of powers had been tried before, um, but it hadn't really worked. Over history, most countries' governments had had, you know, might have had different branches, but there was always one person who had all the authority, whether that be a king, an emperor, a czar, a parliament. Um, there was always sort of a resounding, a final version, um, someone who had all of the power ultimately at the end. And this was a concern with this new government. Um, the Americans had just fought a long war against a government that they felt had too much power over them. And they didn't have rights or grievances, uh, a way of expressing their rights and grievances against this government. So we sort of have twofold here. The first is a checks and balances, a separation of powers. And just like today, we have the legislative branch, the executive, and the judicial. And each one of these branches has a significant role to play in our government, but not one branch has all of the power. So you see, it's whether nominating a justice or writing a new law, the branches have to work together. There's often competition amongst the branches, but they have to work together for our government to function. So there's no one part of our government that has all of the power. Yeah, I think that's uh, an important point, Kev, that it's not just checks and balances in terms of checking each other's power. It also promotes that teamwork, whereas you know, each branch has the different strengths and different members coming from different points of view. And so we're actually better because the branches have to work together and, and have that teamwork, the government. Um, really, is, is it, that's what makes it so unique and special. Exactly. It's a division of power. And not only sort of across the branches where you have your legislative, your executive, and your judicial, but also top to bottom. So we sort of start with our federal government at the top, um, but then you go from there to your state government. So the different governors of each of your states. And then from there, you have your local governments. Um, so whether that's, you know, your local mayor, your town council. Um, so we're dividing power up. Uh, among so many different areas of this country. Uh, and then these are by elections too. So the idea is that no one has all of the power, but ultimately the influence for all of these different branches will come from the people. Uh, and this was new. This was something that hadn't really been tried before. And we are sharing great resources in the chat for a lot of what we're talking about. We have uh, great um, learning materials on each one of these topics, uh, foundations of democracy and the uh, separation of powers, battles of the branches, the um, structural constitutions, articles one, two, and three, the Bill of Rights, all of that is going in the chat because you can find that all on our website. Um, all right, well, Kev, let's take a look at that Bill of Rights because it is Bill of Rights Day and I know we're running out of time. So. All right, so the other concern, of course, was that we needed a way or the people needed a way um, to have a list of rights and to have it stated that the government could not interfere with those rights. 
And of course, we mentioned that there was debate about whether or not to include a list of rights. Um, but ultimately, it would be decided sort of during the ratification process, many of the states felt that they wouldn't accept the Constitution unless Congress agreed then to have a list of rights, a Bill of Rights. So let's move in here and take a look at our version of the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights, as we said, are the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. Uh, and James Madison, the father of the Constitution, sort of took it upon himself um, to be the main author of the Bill of Rights. I'm going to step out of the shot for one moment and let you take a look at our version of the Bill of Rights here. So there were 14 versions of the Bill of Rights originally uh, that were sent out to the different states for ratification. James Madison ultimate, or originally proposed 19 amendments to be added to the Constitution. Well, you think, you know, we have 10, you know, what happened to the other ones? Well, it's a two-step process to amend the Constitution. Any proposed amendment must be submitted to Congress. Congress must get at least two-thirds majority approval uh, of each amendment. If this occurs, then it is sent out to the various states and three quarters of the states are required to ratify it for that amendment to actually take effect. So Madison initially has 19, I'm sorry, 19 amendments sent and then 12 of those amendments are approved by Congress and submitted to the states, which brings us to our document here. There were 14 original versions of the Bill of Rights, one kept by the federal government and one sent out to each of the different states to ratify. And of those 14 copies, 12 are known to survive today. Eight states officially possess their copy. The Delaware copy and the congressional copy are housed in the National Archives building in Washington, DC. And four states officially do not possess their copy. New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Georgia. Now of those four copies, there are two known to survive today that are unidentified. We know they're original, but we're not sure which state they were originally intended to go to. And one of those copies was discovered in the New York Public Library. And it wasn't immediately clear whether it was New York's copy or Pennsylvania's copy. Um, so the two states agreed on a loan where they will share the document every three years, the document of the Bill of Rights gets exchanged between the New York Public Library and Philadelphia. Um, so we're able to display at different times the version of the Bill of Rights uh, right here in this space. I love that history mystery. It's like we found this, you know, no one thought to say this is going to be important 200 years from now, let's make sure we keep it in a safe space. They, that, and so those documents just kind of went missing until, you know, someone discovered it was in a drawer. <laughs> Right, absolutely. And that's an important part of not only our mission, but you know, other museums um, to be able to preserve these documents for future generations to look at. You know, we're very fortunate that these documents are here 229 years later, uh, and we do everything we can to make sure that they're here for the next 229 years. So now that we've sort of seen the history of you know, the drafting of the Bill of Rights, let's see if we can come over here and take a look at just what exactly goes into our Bill of Rights. And I think um, that Bonnie had a great question that kind of relates to that, Kev, is, um, you know, we have those 10 amendments. Is there any particular order to how they were included? Is there any importance to the order that they were included? Um, so as we're going through, maybe if you could touch on that for Bonnie. Of course, that's a great point. Um, and I would suggest that there wasn't necessarily an order of importance, or at least James Madison didn't have an order of importance, because his first two amendments were actually the ones that didn't make the cut. So if we come up over here, we have sort of the transcript, because it is difficult to read this document. Let's take a look at the 12 amendments that made it through Congress and were submitted out to the states. So this here shows the 12 amendments that James Madison proposed. Starting with Article the Third, we have freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, the right to assemble, and the right to petition the government. These five freedoms, collectively the freedom of expression, make up the foundations in our First Amendment. So Article the Third here really is our First Amendment. But let's look at these other ones here that didn't make the cut, because James Madison listing these started with Article the First. This uh, contained a formula for the number of representatives that we should have in Congress. Because of course, remember, we're expanding the country, we're adding new states, uh, and how are we going to build up Congress? 
Well, this proposal stated that we should have one member of Congress for every 50,000 people living in America. If we had adopted that formula back in 1791, and we were one state short of doing so, we would have somewhere around 6,500 members of the House of Representatives today. Uh, so suffice to say, we would need a larger building. The other article uh, has a more interesting story. James Madison's original Article 2, uh, or Amendment 2, suggested that members of Congress who get their salary from the taxpayers cannot just vote themselves a pay raise uh, during any part of their congressional term. In order to get a pay raise, they must have the next election. Uh, so the voters actually have a say over whether or not Congress will vote uh, on a pay raise. Well, this amendment, unlike future amendments that have been given time limits, um, was not given a time limit and was sort of left pending for close to 200 years. And it wasn't until 1982 uh, where it resurfaces. Uh, and for the students that we have here who may be assigned a class project, um, this story here really uh, illustrates the importance of class projects. Uh, in 1982, uh, a Texas student named Gregory Watson was given an assignment. Uh, he was attending the college of um, the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, and he's given an assignment by his political science professor to come up with an amendment, come up with your own amendment, and show how this amendment could be added to the Constitution. So remember, we said it's a two-step process. Um, first, you would need Congress to support it, and then you would need the states to support it. Well, rather than going back and coming up with his own amendment, Watson did some research and found James Madison's original Second Amendment. And he realized that this amendment had already been approved by Congress back in 1789. So in theory, all that would be required would be to have this amendment get ratified by at least three quarters of the states and then it passes into law. So Watson submits this to his uh, teacher and the teacher is less than impressed that Watson skipped the first half of the assignment uh, and gives him, I believe, a C minus for his project. But Watson had come to believe that this was actually an important idea and it should be added to the Constitution. So he starts making calls to people in his state, people in other states, uh, eventually gets a hold of members of state legislatures and Congress. And eventually, and it takes a long time, 10 years, um, but ultimately enough people thought that this was a good idea that it gets added on in 1992 to become our 27th and most recent constitutional amendment. Um, so really illustrating um, what the founders thought about the amendment process. Uh, it should be deliberate. Maybe they weren't envisioning 200 years worth of deliberation, um, but it should be something that a lot of people should support uh, and it would take a lot of time to debate. So most amendments, even though there have been, I think it's over 11,000 amendments have been uh, proposed in Congress. Um, there's only been 33 amendments that Congress has approved. And of those 27 of them have been ratified by the states. Uh, so that sort of rounds out our Constitution, in effect. We have our seven articles and now 27 amendments to the Constitution. Uh, yeah, and I think, I think that's the formal portion of our tour today. So I'll turn it back over to Jenna. And if we have any questions at all, uh, we'd be happy to hear from our viewers. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, Kevin, because it did, um, you know, we, we said this in some of our scholar exchanges recently. Our scholars have pointed out that that was the point was that they didn't want the Constitution to be subject to the whims and, you know, kind of passing will of the day. They wanted it to be a deliberative um, document where people took their time and it really reflected the overall like trajectory of where we all as a people are, are going in the long term and the big picture. And so I think that um, we talked about that with the um, uh, in our in our Congress session that and in our uh, browse the branches sessions that that's how um, how come it sometimes it takes a long time to get legislation passed but I think the same could be said for uh, for the amendment process. Absolutely. Um, but that's such a great story about Watson. Um, but it also kind of highlights the fact that that. Um, that amendment didn't really fit with the rest of them. The other amendments really are about those civil liberties and I think that um, it that point kind of suggests why we talked about the declaration to the Bill of Rights um, in this particular exhibit and on today, Bill of Rights Day. And um, we would be remiss if we didn't also talk about the 14th Amendment too and talking about the Bill of Rights and how it wrote a lot of those 
declaration, um, the freedoms mentioned in the declaration and of course reinforced in the Bill of Rights kind of the 14th Amendment hammers it home that all of those documents kind of work together in promising those rights and then delivering on them with the 14th Amendment and the Bill of Rights kind of um, writing into law, into the constitution, those promises of the declaration. So that's why we, we talk about them today on Bill of Rights Day. <laughs> all right going to look, can you present an amendment to the House and Senate first? And so yes, so, so a couple of questions are just coming about the amendment process. Can um, amendments go to the Senate first or the House first? So yeah, they can start in just like any other legislation, they start in either House of Congress. Um, and then amendments can actually also come from the states up. They don't have to come directly from the Congress. It's not as likely, it's not as common, but amendments can even start in states. So that was a question from, uh, from Charles, right, Kev? Yes, that's a good point. Um, so there's sort of two other um, ways in which an amendment can um, be added to the Constitution. Uh, we mentioned that it, um, genocide it can come from the states, uh, not directly from Congress. Uh, that has happened uh, one time, and that was the 21st Amendment, where it went through sort of the state legislatures first. But there is a whole other way um, that we can change the Constitution. The founders wrote this in. Uh, it hasn't yet happened. Um, but if I think it's three quarters of the states were to call for another constitutional convention, uh, if enough states decided that we should have a whole other convention, then during that convention, amendments could be proposed and added to the Constitution. Uh, as of yet, we have not had a second constitutional convention, um, but the founders weren't sure whether or not that would be necessary. So that was written into the Constitution. So there is another way that we can amend it, um, but we haven't used that way yet. So we have a question from Kai Kim um, about what the next amendment should be. And I think we, uh, Kevin and I are going to stay out of that one because we talk about what the actual, like the existing constitution says, but I would encourage you guys to talk about that in the chat as, uh, you know, uh, what, what do you think the next amendment could or should be? Uh, we don't talk about should here at the Constitution Center. So we'll turn that one back to you guys. Um, so thank you all so much. I think we are almost out of time. Um, so uh, if you do have any last minute questions, go ahead and send them our way. But um, I'm going to wrap up uh, kind of the way I started with our commercial. You can learn about um, the Bill of Rights, um, all of the stuff we talked about, that structural constitution, the separation of powers, the um, those battles of the branches, the role of each branch, all of that can be learned at our live classes. Um, so you can find that on our website. We have the individual uh, learning material modules uh, for each one of those topics, but then we are also teaching live classes. Um, you can watch the recorded sessions or come to the live classes. In terms of Bill of Rights topics, we have all of February long, we're doing First Amendment. Uh, later this year, we're gonna hit Second Amendment, Fourth Amendment. Um, and then also revisit the Bill of Rights overview in April. So come to those live classes. If you can't come live, uh, then you can join us, um, record it. You can watch those recorded sessions. Um, and then use those module pages to really dig into our other resources. We have fantastic resources here at the Constitution Center, podcasts, uh, you know, blog posts. We have interact a lot of our um, interactives that we have in the museum are also online for you to use. So please check out those learning module pages um, and all of our educational resources. And that third pillar is of course the museum. We have a fantastic museum and although we are closed to the public, um, our virtual doors are wide open. Um, so you can actually book, if you liked this tour, um, you can book uh, tours of four of our fantastic exhibits, Signers Hall, The Story of We the People, The Civil War and Reconstruction, and our brand new 19th Amendment exhibit uh, that explores how women won the vote. Um, so book those tours for your, your class, your um, your club, your after school club, or a community group. Like I said, we even do family reunions. <laughs> so you can, uh, you know, happy hours for, uh, you know, professional development events. Uh, so we would, we would love to be able to bring you into our museum. Um, so those are our three kind of big pillars of education here at the NCC. You can visit us at our website, constitutioncenter.org. You can follow us on social media at constitutionctr and hashtag NCCED. Uh, so thank you so much, Kevin, uh, for, uh, for showing us this little corner of the Constitution Center today and teaching us about the Bill of Rights. And uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll say goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Take care.